Okay, so um, person perception we were talking about, we will talk very much about movie villains a little bit, because I think one of the things that really, um, that I really like about this topic that I take to my personal life is that once you understand kind of the way we perceive people, you also understand better how to build compelling characters, how to build interesting characters, why we, for instance, are so afraid of some villains and other villains not, and we will dig a little bit deeper into that just to give you a bit of extra but basically what we are wanting to understand today is just if I look at a person right person perception if I look at Lou if I look at you if you look at me what do you see uh, what comes to your mind right what are the first evaluation that you um, that come to your mind what are your first impressions and how do they if they guide your behavior thereafter and are you good at that are you good at figuring out for instance if i'm trustworthy or not all of these topics we will talk about i want to start with something um a little bit oh i just wanted to say thank you so much um here's the festinger social comparison board this is how it looks like at 3 p.m and ultra social humans are in the gold spot right now um, and have the highest scores um, in their uh, yes for their uh, for their work last or the week before actually from week one um, Friday 4 p.m. is on their heels and so is stars but everyone is just the first week and as you can see you can easily flip the board um, I think most groups already sent me their coursework or their not coursework their group work for today uh, for this week for last week about the applications if your group hasn't uh, please make sure to send it to me till tomorrow midnight so I can calculate the scores um, for tomorrow uh, or for Wednesday and I will send around the scores then on Wednesday um, but let's come back to the content here and I want you guys to use the chat function and tell me a little bit when you look at this person when you have a look at his face and I know you're not supposed to judge the book by its cover but maybe we learned today that you should judge a book by its cover what comes to your mind uh, if you could just like type it in into the chat and we kind of have a look what are your first impressions if you look at this um, uh, gentleman here? Okay, <laughs> Scola. Somebody knows who it is. He's rich. He's a Scola. Okay. <laughs> um, it is Harold Shipman, for those who do know, doctor. Okay. Um, fantastic. So there's rich Scola doctor. Looks like Robin Williams' brother. I'm so happy that somebody said that. That's Tom who said that because I always feel like that too. Adorable old man. <laughs> um, and then somebody said, yes, Harold Shipman. I think you. Uh, somebody knows him. Um, white hair, some wrinkles, looks weathered. He looks tired. Okay. Professor. Anything else? Okay. So I think there's some, like, I think at least one person knows who this is, but we will come back. I uh, will pretend that we have not spoiled the surprise yet. But um, the one of the key ideas here is of um, uh, this exercise is to say, like, okay, uh, what comes to our mind? And always something comes to our mind. This is kind of like when I do this, I did this exercise in India and in Mumbai, in Seoul and Korea. I did it obviously in London. I do this with um, uh, uh, often as part of my kind of teaser lecture for coming to city and do uh, psychology here and people have a very uh, all across the world right have a very similar impression of this person who is a doctor and whose name is Harold Shipman as somebody um, already mentioned people often describe it as kind of like I think somebody um, described to kind of summarize this here really adorable old man and this is often one theme the other theme is that people would describe him as a scholar as a doctor as a scientist um rich i don't know like i think when i did this in uh in korea with high school children some they thought he looked a little bit like a homeless person which i, was like, I don't know this is not how uh, uh british homeless people look like but maybe we have higher standards in korea but here we have rich and homeless so not everyone agrees obviously on everything um, and I'll come back to a little bit about Harold Shipman's story um, that was kind of uh, highlighted already a little bit in the chat, and we come back to this. Okay. 
Um, so this is basically what we're trying to figure out. Um, just to give you a little bit before we dig, dig deeper into the content to kind of like, okay, so we do we form these impressions and what we want to talk about is okay why and how do we form these impressions and i just want to kind of say okay like let's i think it's easiest often to demonstrate as using some movie heroes and villains and we will talk about three or four movie villains here hannibal lecter is one of them i yesterday looked it up and looked at okay who's the most um I don't know, I think there's on Wikipedia, there's a list of best movie villain. He's the number one, as you can see, playing Anthony Topkins, uh, playing Hannibal Lecter. For those of you who do not know who Hannibal Lecter is, he's kind of like this psychopathic serial killer who's also like a somewhat of a, a, a genius, okay? So he's the number one. Why is he so terrifying? And why are we so afraid of him? Why does he haunt our uh, uh, sleep if you're a little bit like me and slightly afraid of horror movies? But there are also other other people, right? There's Hans, I don't know, as you can see, most of my movies are consumed with my children. There's Hans from Frozen, right? A little different flavor. There's Snape. Why do, do we think like, and this is like something where we uh, want to come back to this, why are these two, for instance, really compelling characters? What does it kind of mislead us in, in, uh, in directions? And I think if you can see kind of like an understand person perception, at the end of this lecture, you will understand person perception much, much better than before. And you will see how Hollywood, how movies, how authors use these kind of fundamental ways of how we perceive others to kind of lure us apart, to play with our expectations and then surprise us. And this is part of the lecture. Um, so this is kind of a little bit to trying to under help you uh, know where you can apply it in your daily life, not just when you see the people around you, but also when you watch Netflix at night, you can kind of as like, oh, why do I like this person? Why don't I like this person? Why do I have these first impressions of that person? Um, uh, so this is what we are going to do today. We will talk about first impressions uh, in our first chapter and the fundamental dimensions of first impressions. We will then talk about, can we trust them? So if you have a certain perception of another person, can you trust um, uh, your intuitions? Should you trust them? What are the cues we are using to form these? Uh, and how do they impact our behavior? Um, we have a shorter section then on kind of like foreshadowing a little bit what we will later have when we talk about attitudes, when we talk about racism, when we talk about groups, but kind of you can use the same ideas and apply them not only to people, but also to groups. How do we perceive individuals? individuals from certain groups. And you can see that this very much impacts our emotions and our reactions, our behavior to these people. This is what I'm trying to do um, in the lecture uh, today. And then for the additional two videos, we will talk about biases and person perception. For instance, the, uh, yes, the halo, uh, why if somebody has, we perceive as one uh, good attribute, why do we think that the same person then has also other good attitudes? And we will talk about something that might students brought up last year and now I'm doing some uh, research projects for their third year dissertations on this topic and this is beauty beauty is a privilege um, why do beautiful people have such a better life than uh, less attractive people and we will talk a little bit about how basically the perception of attractiveness impacts how we perceive another person and also the real world outcomes how this leads to a uh, 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 better treatment in uh, from judges from employee uh, employers employees and so forth okay so we talk a little bit about beauty as a, a privilege and what we can learn about this in person perception last um last week uh somebody asked me at the uh, at the end she's like oh what is that um take home message from your lecture and i thought <laughs> i included one but maybe i didn't highlight it and so now i want to kind of say like okay if you um at the end of the this is the take home message right this is the bigger picture that i want you to uh, leave with after this lecture today and that we will dive deeper into it okay so here's our example again here's harold shipman and you'll see him quite a bit uh, today um but here you see and what happens right so what research tells us that the first thing that basically happens if we um uh let's focus on this um i'm not sure why the uh, animations came up all so quickly here so what happens if we see harold shipman and research tells us that the first thing we evaluate is what often is called as warmth or 
com uh, its warmth or trustworthiness or his moral character. So the first impression we form is basically, is Harold Shipman, uh, this is uh, the person on the picture here, is he a good person or not a good person? Thereafter, we form judgments about his competence. Do we think he's a competent um, uh, uh, person? Do we think that he's capable of getting things done? So it seems like that whenever we meet a person, we at least use these two e quick evaluations to see if we uh, like to uh, form a judgment and evaluate that other person. This is very much impacted by the context, right? You can think about Harold Shipman if you have to figure out if you go and meet him uh, in the uh, in your surgery and you're just like, okay, is he a good doctor or not? Right? I don't know, but this is different than if you think like, do you think he's a good barista or not? Right? Contacts really matter, and uh, whether we uh, how we apply these um, evaluations. So that's another uh, kind of like we have these two dimensions. The context in which we make them uh, really matters. Um, we also will see that, oops, okay, okay uh, there's in a, a top, I'm not sure what's going on with my animations here, but in a top, you can see what also obviously really matters is like in which kind of group we put them, okay? So if we think about, okay, Harold Chipman, he's part of the elderly, I will have very much different um, reactions towards him than when I think, okay, he's a doctor, he's a part of the, a member of the group of the doctors, or of, for instance, all white people or old white men, right? We have very different reactions on which kind of membership group membership is highlighted so that we will talk about and that's really important um we will also i don't know okay i'll just leave the two on them i'm not sure what's going on with my animations we will show and talk about that we make these evaluations really quickly and that we often get them wrong right so we have these two dimensions that we evaluate people we make these evaluations super quickly but we um, get it often wrong and we will talk about the cues we use and why this indicates that we often misjudge other people um, so this is just like here, if you remember from our first lecture, we talked about Wayne Cousin, the murder of Sarah Everhart. And so we can't see reliably, uh, this is kind of like the bottom line, we can't really rely uh, uh, on looking at his picture. It's like, ah, I know, I can see he's evil. Um, and we will talk at the end a little bit about why maybe part of person perception, why there's such a strong emotional reaction to um, uh, uh, Sarah Everhart's uh, uh, case and the role her picture might have played in that and we will come back to that as well okay so let's talk about first impressions and i want to just uh, step one uh, a little bit back and kind of think a little bit about the global or the broader picture that social psychologists often have to face and so when we think about or not social psychologists have to face but we as humans right there are kind of two key problems in our life. One of the problems is information overload. Whenever you have to kind of make a judgment, make a decision, there's so much information available um, that you have to decide which information to pay attention to and which information not to pay too attention to, right? So it's impossible to process in a kind of even-handed manner all this information. So you have to find solutions to information overload. So there's no other way around. Humans can't um, compute that much data in that short time in order to make the decisions. So um, our psyche, our mind has to kind of figure out how can I handle all that information that's coming in. And this is not only a problem for social psychologists, but also for cognitive, clinical, etc. Right. Um, on the other hand, there's also always uncertainty, right? The information that we have, for instance, if you look at Harold Shipman, you do not know um, what to think of him. And you know that if you kind of, let's for instance, think like, oh, he looks like a competent, trustworthy doctor. I'm happy to be here. I think I, uh, uh, I'm happy to be his, patients, uh, his patient. Then you also know that this is an imperfect judgment. You know that you might be wrong. So, and there's some information that we just don't have access to it. So there's always uncertainty that we also have to handle. And so there's like these two bits um, and social psychology uh, uh, has to find answers in all of our topics that we talk about to each of them, right? It's not just personal perce person perception as you will see the South has to handle in a second, the same problem. Um, so the idea would basically be like when we uh, not only see his face or when we make uh, uh, decisions about the impressions we have of others, we have to on our one hand uh, handle the problem of information overload, and on the other hand, on the other hand, the uh, inherent uncertainty of knowing somebody else's character. 
Um, so there are kind of three answers social psychology uh, provides, how people in general handle uncertainty and information overload. One of them is basically is called the cognitive miser. This is uh, Susan Fisk and Charlie Taylor uh, here pictured on the left. And there are basically general ideas that people handle, uh, they're cognitive misers, okay? We're cognitive lazy. And so whenever we can, we save all the cognitive energy. We do not like in general to think to invest too much effort in our thinking. So this leads us prone to kind of use um, very obvious signals, simplified signals such as stereotypes, group membership, in order to um, process how we think about other people. We come back to this again and again when we talk about other aspects of attitudes of persuasion and so forth. But the cognitive miser um, is one approach to understand why people, for instance, do not uh, question their assumptions about somebody etc okay um, often uh, this is uh, kind of like uh, um, complemented with a second approach and this is basically the approach from um, whoops I don't know what's going on with my animations this is Kahneman and Tversky as you can see you probably by now know them the most uh, famous influential uh, so, uh, psychologist not social psychologist psychologist in the uh, 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 yeah in psychology and their answer was a little bit different they say okay when we make decisions when we make these judgments it is not just that we are cognitive misers that we kind of use the easiest way out no we use certain heuristics and biases to process we come back to this when we talk about um, stereotypes we come back to this in chapter four and five when we talk about uh, in the additional videos but here this idea is basically that i use certain systematic easy ways to process the data and that gives my, me then the feeling that i made a good judgment okay so here I have like shortcuts, I use shortcuts to form impressions of others. Um, and there's a third approach, which is not really associated with one or two people, but this is motivated cognition. And we, yes, um, yesterday I want to say, last week we talked about one specific form of um, motivated cognition, that is self-enhancement. I want to think of myself, I'm motivated to think of myself as a good person. I want, I'm motivated to think of uh, a person that is on control and can uh, uh, predict the world around them and the future for myself looks bright and positive so i'm motivated to arrive at certain conclusions right often these don't really contradict each other in uh, these three different approaches but this is like uh, the first two approaches the cognitive misers and the uh, heuristics and biases approaches does not take motivation into account i'm very much part of the motivated cognition idea that you want certain things to be true you want certain other things things not to be true and that then guides how you handle uncertainty you use that uncertainty to uh, and the information to, uh, overload to selectively uh, process that information that you like and reject the information that you do not like okay so that ties it a little bit together also with last uh, uh, week's lecture um, so we talked about kind of like, okay, I ask you to give uh, judgments about uh, Harold Shipman. I think you basically had these like, almost as if you already have done that. He says like, he's, he seems like an old, nice gentleman, a scholar. Um, and for a very long time, this is basically what social psychologists and person perception started to do in the 60s and 70s. What they would do is they would present people with pictures of politicians or friends and would ask them to um, give qualities, characteristics, traits, um, and ask him, okay, if you have to describe this person, how would you describe them? Use these words, use a free description, and so forth. And again and again and again, what we find is from the first study to basically today is that there are these two fundamental dimensions um, uh, kind of like show up, okay? So this is here, as you can see on the left, um, this is a basically a reprint, a nicer reprint of the results from Rosenberg et al. 1968 as a classic study, study who kind of first illuminated like, oh, there seems to be these two fundamental dimensions, okay? Uh, this is from the uh, article of the week. Um, they kind of reprinted it, made it nicer in Cardi Fisk and Click. But what you find is here, and let me just kind of um, uh, activate my laser pointer. So here you have, okay, let's start with this. And this is often called warmth 
or trustworthiness. Um, we will come about like the names for these dimensions. Here, what they, what Rosenberg and all, they called it social desirability. How desirable is another person socially? So if you can see on the kind of bad social is a person that's unpopular, that's unhappy, that's waned, that's pessimistic, humorless, cold, moody, boring, dishonest. It's like, okay, no, this is dishonest. Yes, okay. So there seems to be something that's not a person that's very socially pleasant, but also a little bit uh, shaky morally. And then here on the good side, you're like honest, reliable, tolerant, helpful, sincere, happy, popular, sociable. Okay, so you have one dimension that people, and this is like the first dimension we, most social psychologists think and agree upon, we first evaluate. So if you see me, the first thing you're trying to figure out, like how on this kind of social dimension, where should I put Andreas, okay? The second one, and maybe uh, because in the context you get to know me, a more important one is whether I'm basically competent or not. Um, sometimes this is called uh, inte intellect, sometimes competence, sometimes agency. But the key idea is like, how capable is that person? So you would look at me and say like, okay, is Andreas a good teacher and a good scientist? Okay, so a good intellect is scientific, persistent, determined, skillful, industrious, intelligent, etc. right? And then here's basically on the other hand, you so like Andreas is foolish, clumsy, naive, impulsive, irresponsible, and so forth. So, okay. so you have kind of like you see somebody, you would see Harold Shipman, you would see Yasmin, you would see me. And the first thing you would say like, okay, is she, where is he, where are they on both of these dimensions? Um, and so this is basically uh, an insight that still stands the test of time after uh, years and years and decades of research of that. Uh, most uh, models really agree that we have these two different Different dimensions okay um so i don't know what with my slides okay so the key idea here is that okay if you want to understand why for instance hannibal lecter is so scary then you would say well he is an extreme outlier on two dimensions right he's extremely capable and extremely cold Okay, and that makes him so terrifying. So every kind of horror movie villain has like these two dimensions. They're really cold and they're really immoral, right? To an extreme degree, but they're also extremely capable. And that makes them so terrifying. Okay, so you can see why here, just like why, for instance, like if you want to write a horror movie, then you have to kind of highlight that the other person's not just a bad person, but also how capable they are. Often this is done um, to kind of highlight the intellectual uh, uh, capabilities by having them listen to, for instance, opera or classic music. Uh, we always now associate, oh, he's listening to an opera, mm, little suspect might be a villain. Um, Okay, so these are the kind of, so we have this, and then what happened in the last, I don't know, 55 decades after these Rosenberg studies, different models came along um, to kind of say, okay, what exactly happens in these moments of uh, social perception or so social evaluation? When I try, for instance, to figure out whether Andreas is a good guy or not, um, here are the five most common models. The uh, Another article that you can read for this week, I think I would either, either recommend the uh, Cuddy and Fisk article or the other article, which is like Abel and uh, Fisk is also on it and other people, where they kind of highlight the commonalities and the controversies of these models. We will focus on two models in particular, the stereotype content model and the behavioral regulation model to kind of highlight a little bit the differences. These differences are actually not as big, and I'll show you that in a second. So I think it's a little bit Sometimes it's like, oh, and now we're walking through, oh, maybe it's more like this model or that model. I think for person perception, this is not so crucial because I think that the overlap between these models is pretty significant and the, the kind of controversies are not as important. And I'll show you that in a second. So here are the three controversies. These like where it's like, oh, this is where these five prominent models disagree. The five models we currently use to do uh, kind of explain person perception, right? So there's a bit of the number definition organization and labeling of these dimensions. We come back to that in a second. Okay, how should we lay? Is it warmth? Is it age? Is it communion? Is it intellect? Is it agency and so forth? So maybe not that important, but this is what we scientists like to do. We like to argue about terms and minutia. 
Uh, then we have the kind of the second is the relative priority of these dimensions. What is the most important dimension? There's actually just like, there's basically one that says it is warmth and the other one says it's morality and we come back to that too. And then the relationship among these dimensions, okay. Um, so let's start with looking at the number definition organization labeling of these dimensions. What we know so far is that there's these two dimensions. One is kind of social um, warmth, often characterized as warmth, and the other one kind of like competency or in intelligence. Okay, and I, um, I hope you. I don't know what is this. Okay. Um, it's like, this is like the worst animations ever. Okay, so let's first, um, there's one slide missing here. I'm a little bit, I don't know. Okay, let's just see. Okay, so this is basically the, um, I'm a little bit, okay, uh, whatever. I think it's not so important. I expected a different slide. I wonder where the slide went, but let's just um, kind of uh, move on and think about, okay, um, the, this classic experiment by Ash, and this is more, it's actually more about um, what is the primary dimension? What is the most important dimension? Okay. So if we want to try to figure out which um, uh, uh, dimension, is it basically the kind of warmth or the competence dimension? Which one is better if I uh, evaluate or is more important if I evaluate in a, uh, you as a person? So Ashen in 1946 did a very kind of um, simple experiment. And so what he did is, Solomon Ash, um, is he basically presented people with uh, just traits of a person. I think the easiest way to imagine is that just to imagine that you would have to figure out what do you think about this lecturer? Okay, so think about you don't know anything about the lecture, but then somebody presents you with these traits and maybe this is like this stupid. Um, laser pointer, I don't know, something is off here, let me see if I can just get rid of this laser pointer. I can't. Okay. Um, fantastic. Uh, so. Um, Okay, um, so the person basically is described as intelligent, determined, warm, okay, industrious, practical, and skillful. Okay, so this is one person, and then the students will ask, okay, evaluate this lecture, how uh, uh, good or bad do you perceive this uh, person to be? Um, cautious, sorry. <laughs> uh, and then they do the same, industrious, Okay, I don't know. Um, let me just kind of stop share for a second and see if I can improve this situation um, with the PowerPoint. Okay, and reshare. Okay. All right, so now they do this for the same, uh, the uh, next person. I don't know what is okay um so i don't know if you this is the second person i don't know if you uh despite my uh d technical difficulties spotted the one difference in the description right and it's basically whether the person was described as warm or cold okay that's the only difference they use the same words and what they find is that basically the person that is described as warm uh is uh, uh, perceived as significantly better than a person that is uh, described as cold. If you do this and switch for intelligence, you don't find the same effect. If you use some uh, kind of like uh, uh, synonyms or something like polite or blunt or something like that, then the effect is not as strong. So uh, Ash kind of argued, and this is like, there's a, a, a dominance, a primacy of um, warmth. What really matters is this kind of, whether we think of another person as warm. This is the first and most important impression we form of another person. And hence, most of us uh, smile when we need, uh, when we see another person to kind of enhance the perception of this um, uh, evaluation. Okay. You can also see, so one thing, and we come back to this, but I just want to highlight one thing that um, Kelly uh, followed up with George Kelly, um, what he did is like, okay, he asked, does it actually matter for the behavior? 
right? And Solomon Ash, basically, they ask his students, okay, and it's like, wow, I like the warm lecturer much more than the cold lecturer. Does that actually matter? So this is not the original picture. This is also not George Kelly. This is uh, Stian. He uh, co-piloted last year. He was like co-teaching this module with me last year. So I used him uh, less uh, uh, funny this year, but uh, I just left it in. So let's say we describe Stian as, um, okay. So either we describe it, people who know him, consider him to be rather cold in person, industrious, critical, practical, and determined. So the way Kelly did it is like, next week you will meet uh, a guest lecturer and he will help me or he will run the class. And then he describes him. And so he either describes him as somebody who's cold or is warm and then has the same um, uh, 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 same traits. Uh, uh, both have the same traits, warm and cool. It's the same manipulation that Solomon Ash used, right? And what you can see here then thereafter, he kind of sees how do students interact with one idea. So the person comes actually in. I know, oh, there's the cold um, lecturer. Oh, here's the warm lecturer, right? So the person comes in and then they observe how much they uh, interact with that person. What you can see here, there's this massive difference in how students approach them, right? So if I, for instance, would describe Yasmin uh, or Connie, your um, seminar leaders, right? If I would say like, hey, there's Yasmin, she's really intelligent, she's a little cold, then you would be much li less likely to engage with her than if I would say something like, oh, she's a really warm person. Right? So that signals that there's like it dominates our evaluation, but these evaluation evaluations also matter for our interactions. Okay, so this is kind of like the idea of the primacy of um, 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 uh, of warmth. I think for me. Um, it often also helps to kind of understand a little bit how politics works. Okay, so. In some, and I just want to give like two quick examples. If you think about like um, the uh, um, uh, campaign, Trump versus Hillary Clinton, right? And I think a lot of people were puzzled looking from the outside in that there was Hillary Clinton who was, um, uh, looks like as a really competent leader, a person who has a very tight program, bullet points, does exactly know what she wants to do. And then there was Trump who was kind of like stumbling around a little bit more, who was kind of like, okay, um, uh, uh, I'm not quite sure what I'm doing here, but I can connect to the people, to my voters, right? And so the, the key idea is not to perceive Donald Trump as somebody warm, but the key idea is that he knows how to elicit an evaluation where I think he's on my team. So if he wants me, if he thinks like Andreas is likely to vote for me, then he can, he was good at understanding, like signaling in his demeanor, in his speech, in his uh, tweets, to just like, okay, he's on your team, he's on my team. So I would think, okay, he's on my team, I would think Hillary Clinton is maybe not on my team, right? And once you make that evaluation, it doesn't really matter whether the one person, Donald Trump, is really incompetent and Hillary Clinton is really competent. In actuality, if I think that Hillary is not on my team, the more competent she becomes, the more threatening, right? It's like, oh my God, she's not on my team and she's really, really good. If she, she, she will implement all these policies that will negatively impact me and she will do so very effect effectively, okay? So think a little bit about this kind of like to sometimes understand where it's like, if you, have, if you happen to have a campaign, a political campaign, then often what you have to emphasize much more is not so much the competence, but the warmth. Am I on your team? Am I not on your team? And once you have that, you can further push with competence. But the first thing you need is to kind of figure out whether the person is on your team or not. Okay, that tells us the primacy of warmth. Um, so this also helps us explain something. We come back to that when we talk about our last kind of evaluations of moral character in our last uh, lecture uh, in, in week 11. But this is kind of helps you also to understand, okay, now here's the British, um, uh, this was, Oh, I can't like I can't remember the years. It was like so many election happened, but there was one election where basically um, uh, Ed Miliband was running to become the prime minister, and the key thing that the Sun in trying to stop him uh, before the election night was to show him eating eating uh, a bacon bap. Okay, so he's eating a bacon bap. He's like, look at him, look at him, how he eats this bacon bap. You can't trust him. 
right? And the same with the Guardian did the same with Theresa May. This is a, how can you eat um, f like chips like that, right? How can you eat them and be one of us? How can you eat chips like that with a disgusted face and actually be a working class member? So why do we do this? Because we know that obviously politicians will lie about team membership. There is a, I'm on your team, I want you, right? They will say this again and again. And so we are aware of them. So what we are trying to do is basically look for subtle signs, whether they're one of us or not, right? Whether they're on our team or not, and eating is one of them. So this is basically wherever you are as a politician, the first thing you get is some kind of local specialty that was put in front of you. And then everybody watches you, how you eat that often not very appealing piece of uh, food or drink something appalling. And it's like, oh, okay. He ate that haggis in a somewhat, uh, 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 I don't know, dignified manner. He must be a good guy, okay? So this is how sometimes how weird we are because we want to figure out if somebody is basically uh, one of us, if somebody is a trustworthy person, okay? There's one thing that's really important uh, to kind of think a little bit about and um, different models, and this is the behavior regulation model, puts a real emphasis on that. We come back to that in a second, but they said, like, okay, let's look at the warmth dimension. What is actually going on there? Is it um, the, the person is socially fun or is it that the person is morally good? And you can see if you kind of from the picture, I just cut us out from the picture in the beginning, you can see there are some uh, dimensions that really speak to your moral character, right? I would say, oh, Andreas is honest, he's reliable, he's tolerant, he's modest. All of this is our reflections on my um, moral character, right? And then there's this other bit that is okay. Um, he is uh, popular, sociable, happy, warm, good natured. Right. And what uh, uh, um, Goodwin, Rosen and Piazza, what they argue is and others along them is like they think what drives the basically the uh, impact of warmth is the moral character and not the social bit. OK, it's all about the moral character. There are some studies where they show, OK, morality, the warmth what we actually evaluate is the morality of another person and not so much whether they're fun or sociable. OK, other models just call this the two facets of the first one, but it's important to kind of remember. OK, um, so we often kind of say when we're deciding, OK, uh, do I want to join this group or do I want to do anything uh, with, uh, uh, shall we let this person in, job interviews, et cetera, right? We often look as a first like at the moral, not so much at the sociability, OK? Um, you can think a little bit about these two characters to kind of highlight this before I show you a study, right? On the left, you see Hans. Hans, I don't know how, how long it is ago that you have seen Frozen. I hope you have seen Frozen. Uh, it's, uh, I think, a good movie. Uh, uh, I'm happy to be criticized for that. I enjoyed watching it with both of my children. But Hans is kind of like this fun, competent person. We meet him. They, like he instantly, I think with Anna, I can't remember, they instantly connect. He's charming. He's witty. He seems to be uh, like a social person. But it turns out at the end, right, that is a morally corrupt person, okay? And so what these people do, right, is kind of like what um, movie makers and authors often do is they kind of mix these two dimensions to kind of misguide us, right? Because we often assume that the warm dimension kind of both. If you're fun and happy, you have to be a good, morally good person, right? Um, the contrast is Snape, right? Uh, you don't want to have him over at your dinner party. You don't want to uh, 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 do teamwork with him. but He's a morally good person, right? He's kind of unpopular and uh, uh, unfriendly, not that fun, very competent, um, but he's a good moral character, right? And so at the end of the day, what uh, Rosen and Goodwin are arguing is basically, uh, if we have to choose between the two of them, then we would always go for Snape over Hans because as much fun Hans is, Snape has the better moral character. So in their studies, and sorry, this is like slightly um, blurred here, but but basically what they have, they have these categories where somebody, um, a trait would be high morality, high warmth, right? Humble, kind, forgiving, helpful, grateful, empathetic, cooperative, right? These all reflect good on your moral character and they all reflect good on your social abilities, right? Um, and so there's another category where it's high morality, lower warmth. 
okay? Courageous, fair, principled, responsible, just, honest, trustworthy, loyal, right? It's not that she's like, oh, this sounds like a fun person. He's really responsible, principled, principled and honest. It's not anything like, oh God, I wanna spend a night with him or her, um, but it's something that tells you um, uh, that he would be, for instance, a good person to work with. Um, then there's high warmth, lower morality, right? Um, this is less like you're basically just tells you just how funny um, they are to interact with. And then there are some categories that only speak about ability and neither to warmth nor to morality. And you can see that this is basically like people agree that these words exist, um, that some of these categories on the right hand, if you kind of look at the ratings, right, that um, there are um, words that reflect one, but not the other. There are words that reflect both and there are words that reflect neither. And what they do is then basically they look at what are the best predictors? Um, don't worry too much about this, but if you just look at the second row here, morality, then you see that morality is the strongest predictor and it's an independent predictor of whom we admire. So if I wanna say like, okay, if I wanna be a person that is admired, I have to build up my moral character, not so much my fun factor, okay? A friend is the same, okay? So you can see morality and warmth and morality, the same with parent, are very much similar when we talk about friends and parents. So we are, I think an ideal parent, an ideal friend is somebody who is helpful, right? A morally good person, but also kind of warm and fun to interact with, right? Um, and then you can kind of go down this list. But the key takeaway here is that for most things, people make impressions, the most important aspect of that first dimension is their moral character. We're trying to figure out, is that a good person or not a good person? Um, I have this kind of like, and this is, I think, the last uh, uh, villain in movie villain. It was like, okay, so you can kind of think about sometimes we have these warm characters who are really competent and really evil. And he's kind of, Hans Landa is like, in that is, I think, is Inglorious Bastards, uh, a Quentin Tarantino movie. And there's like this SS colonel, like he's like, I think his nickname is the Jew Hunter. It's like really despicable person, but you meet him and he's absolute kind of like, oh, he's like, he's fun, right? He loves Strudel, he's really uh, educated, witty, um, uh, warm, and so forth. And this creeps you really out. It's so disturbing because all your instincts is like good person, but then it turns out he's a really evil person. So it's like, this is kind of like where the tension often comes in good literature or good movie making, good storytelling, when these dimensions are kind of uh, uh, manipulated in a way that uh, surprise and contradict our uh, common sense evaluations. Okay, speaking of common sense evaluations, all right, let's just uh, quickly summarize what we've learned. So far, we basically said like, okay, what happens is that if I see Harold Shipman, I kind of decide if he's trustworthy or not, and I uh, decide whether he is um, a competent or incompetent person. And my overall evaluation will be dominated by warmth, but incompetence also impacts this. And maybe the warmth that I mentioned, the most important aspect is the moral character. So now we're kind of like asking, okay, can we trust our first impressions? What are the cues we're using to make these first impressions, right? Uh, I think somebody in the chat already kind of revealed my uh, reveal later on, <laughs> like Harold Shipman. I think somebody uh, in the chat mentioned that he murdered his patients, right? Which kind of gives you a little hint of where I'm trying to go with that if we evaluate people, then we often are misguided, right? We look at them, we look at their face, and it doesn't turn out quite right. Right. But is that actually supported by science? What has science to say about it? Why do we like his face and maybe somebody else's face? We don't. Um, okay, so this is like basically the main player here in this area is um, uh, Alexander Todorov. You will see there are many studies that I cite. If you are interested in first impressions, I think he wrote a book about it. I read so many of his articles. I'm not really interested just kind of reading his book, but I heard good things about his book. Alexander Todorov, I think he's at Yale, but I'm not quite sure, somewhere there on the East Coast. Um, he basically does all the important work or did most of the important work in the last decade or maybe now last two decades 
um, on first impressions. And one of his first studies that he did is basically to kind of show that, okay, um, how, are we making quickly decisions about um, trust and competence, right? And what he did is he basically showed one, this is like either one of these five pictures, okay, for 100 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds, and then said like, okay, how trustworthy do you judge this person to be? And what he finds is that um, people, and then he gives you again, um, shows you the same picture and says like, okay, now take your time. You have all the time in the world, form an impression and tell me, what do you think? Is this a trustworthy person? Okay, so we have one on an extreme time pressure, 100 milliseconds, you can clearly see their face, it's nothing that's subliminal happening or unconscious, um, but it's like, it, it is quick, right, you see it and it's gone, okay, and then you're just like, okay, I think this person's trustworthy, what you can see is if you get, if I give you five minutes or 100 milliseconds, basically people come to the same conclusions, so it seems like we immediately quickly form impressions. Um, and then you can also see, and as we come back to this, like if you kind of, you can think about it on yourself, like the person on the left, the male person, non-smiling person, that's a person that people think is not so much trustworthy, but then the female smiling person, that's the highest trustworthy person in this data set, and people agree with that. The only thing that changed, and I think that's quite interesting, is that the more time you give people, the more confident they are that they got it right, <laughs> okay? So I think like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh, I can tell she's a nice person. She's a really nice person. Yeah, now that I thought about it, I'm sure I got it right. I can trust my gut. And um, this is the right impression. Um, so Alexander Todorov then kind of did this really interesting paper in, which is super influential in kind of the first impression literature where he basically used computer models to have the kind of prototypically trusted versus untrusted face. So on the right, you see the untrusted face. The left, you see the trusted face. You see a smiling female figure. There's some, um, so this is kind of like a, a more machine learning approach where you uh, look at certain features and try to think, okay, let's give people people a thousand faces, they rate them um, for the trustworthiness. And then we kind of learn how these ratings are organized, okay? And so what you can see is basically after kind of using some of these procedures, you arrive on a face like on the left, a female smiling face um, as a, one face that uh, signals trust and the kind of male unsmiling fail, a face is one that, um, uh, is not trustworthy, but might look a little bit more competent, a little bit more potent, okay? And then you can arrange these, um, uh, um, I think just, um, <laughs> if we can arrange, sorry, I, I had to look at the chat, stupid me. Um, uh, you can uh, arrange them and see like, okay, basically people are high in this kind of competence, trust and versus low. All right. And what you can see in some sense, I think I don't want to bore you too much with these details about it, but what it seems like if I um, evaluate uh, neutral faces, non-smiling faces, I look for features that remind me of emotions. So if a neutral face basically looks a little bit like a smiling face, or if a neutral face is kind of um, looks a little bit um, like an angry face, okay, then you will, this is how your first impressions are formed. Okay, so you have these kind of signals within if somebody comes at you and smiles and um, you think, okay, they don't want me harm. Um, and so I form an impression like that. If somebody looks at you and comes at you angry, then it's like, oh God, they want me harm. And so if I look at a face that looks in general a little bit more angry, uh, then I will have a negative evaluation of them. And if, it, uh, uh, if they kind of remind me of a smiling, uh, a, a approachful person, then I will have a trustworthy evaluation of them. Um, okay, so you can kind of like, there are two other cues. Um, one we talk a little bit about when we talk about um, um, attractiveness, but one is like the baby faceness. So a big eyes, kind of a part, like eyebrows, uh, tiny nose, right? Kind of like the Disney princess, a little bit like, uh, uh, like Sarah does. And she's like, oh, just a good person, a really good person, really trustful uh, person, just because of the features of the face, okay? Uh, the other one is familiarity, right? This is something we come back when we talk about um, uh, racism, but it's often for us, we kind of like, if this is an unfamiliar face, we're like, Meh, I don't know, not sure about him or her, okay? And obviously this, uh, we are more um, 
familiar with the faces of our in-group versus our out-group. Okay, um, two quick points on this. Um, one really interesting study is that you can kind of like the question is like, okay, is this something we're born with or is this something cultural? Is, is this just in the West? Is this just in kind of Western societies? Is this just like in developed countries where we see these fundamental dimensions? Is it that, for instance, if I go to the Bolivian, um, uh, um, uh, um, which <laughs> it's not forest, I can't think of the right word. Uh, what's the dense, uh, you know what I'm talking about, Amazon forest, right? So if you if you go there and uh, meet uh, uh, Tsimane, who live there, who are kind of like live basically very much as they lived a thousand years ago, and then you give them a face of an American, okay? Um, and they have to make judgments. What kind of judgments would they make? And what these authors here were interested in was basically, would Americans make the same judgments about other Americans and other tsunami people, right? And what you find is that there's a <laughs> surprising large overlap of uh, what uh, people here in the Bolivian uh, Amazon forest and people in America think about who's attractive and who's trustworthy, right? Uh, they agree uh, on basically, if they have to rate, let's say the, um, uh, uh, the nice woman here, right? I say nice woman, I think it's impossible not to uh, see her face here on the right and not think she's a nice woman. Um, and so did Tsunami agree to think like, yes, she looks like a really nice woman. And I and you and me, we all think, yes, she looks like a really nice woman. Might be true, might not be true, but that's what I would go with on the, uh, my first impression. So it seems, to be, it seems to be that it's not really dependent on the culture we're in, it's not really dependent on um, the uh, like uh, uh, developmental level of the society. Um, very much in a similar vein is the research here. This is again uh, research done by um, Alex Todorov, but also by Manazi uh, uh, Benaji um, and Mazarin Benaji. Sorry, and um, here they look at like children, three to four year olds, five to six year olds, adults, um, and they said like, okay, if I show you a face like this one in high trustworthiness. Here you see these avatars that Alexander Tover, Todorov developed, right? Um, then you can see, okay, trustworthiness, high. And then you can see, okay, about 77% of the children say, this is a trustworthy high face. And basically uh, the adults get a little bit better, but it's like from three to four year olds already kind of say, oh, this is a trustworthy face. This is not a trustworthy face, okay? Um, this is also, there's a, one kind of a slightly creepy study where you can use that to see if um, uh, trustworthy um, um, adult approaches children on a playground, if they are more likely to follow them or not, right? But this is kind of like there's, and yes, uh, uh, they're more likely if you have a trustworthy face to be kind of like you can easily, more easily um, direct them somewhere else, okay? So we trust, and it seems like the same principle that apply to adults very early on apply to children. Again, saying like it seems to be something that we come evolutionary and aid with and not something that is developed over time. Okay, um, I have basically two minutes left um, and I'm running out of time. Um, let me just kind of highlight a little bit the behavioral consequences of these first impressions. This is another study by Alexander Todorov where basically see you can use these pictures, show them uh, participants and ask them how competent they are. So when you're like electing local officials, you want competent people. So you, and how do you evaluate whether they're competent or not? You look at their face. And you can basically, if you know nothing about them, but only uh, the average perception of competence from people somewhere, uh, doesn't even have to be in, uh, uh, in that part of the world, you can predict the election outcomes. So if you are a politician, the most important thing, basically a local politician or on a global stage, did you look competent? Okay, so these impressions matter, right? Um, this is for scientists. Scientists um, also have to have to kind of look at, if you would look at me, I need to look uh, competent. Maybe I should put a jacket on to kind of, okay, uh, he's wearing a suit jacket, so he's a little bit more competent. And then good scientists are also kind of like, I have to signal morality, right? Uh, attractiveness, for instance, for a, um, 
uh, scientist is not a good thing. It makes people interested. But if they think you're good looking, they also think you're less likely to be a good scientist. So there's something that runs counter to that, where you think like, okay, it's somewhat mutually exclusive. But you can see that here, which role you are putting on, whether competence or, uh, sorry, whether politician or scientist, or maybe doctor or something else, we also change a little bit the evaluations and their impact. Um, we, uh, and I will end this here uh, with, with Harold Chipman, kind of like if you, somebody already tweeted, it's perfectly fine. If you know it, you should not hold back. I said tweeted, it's uh, in the, put in a chat, but you know what I mean. Harold Chipman is uh, um, uh, the UK's most prolific um, uh, serial killer, right? He was a person who enjoyed killing his patients. Um, and he would basically uh, uh, go to, to the home of an old person. He would be their doctor. He would inject them something and they would slowly die. And he liked to, he enjoyed watching them uh, die. Um, it is actually like, if you read the report about him, the police, the first time they said like, oh, there's something suspicious going on with him. They came back and said like, he looks so nice. We can't believe that he's a murderer. <laughs> That's what, in the police report right insanity um so this is uh, uh reflects also on the competence of our police but that's not what we should be uh talking about okay and so let me kind of tell you maybe i think like uh, two things um one thing is to just highlight that um, this is another study by Alexander Todorov, as you might have guessed, where he says, like, okay, can, why are we not good? What are we picking up when we judge trustworthiness, right? And what he shows is that basically people uh, have very different impressions based on context and on uh, whether there's expression of the same person, right? Here in the right corner, for instance, you see the two women, right? Um, the same woman, um, uh, different uh, facial expressions, different pictures, and one is like reliably judged to be more trustworthy when they show this picture versus that picture, right? It's like if I show you uh, five pictures of myself, each time you would have a different um, uh, impression of myself. Um, this is the same thing for context. Um, this is here, if you kind of look at this, is like where uh, people are shown pictures and then they have to decide um, what is the best role for this person, right? You can see here, this person, like if I show you picture one, uh, he's most likely to think he's a really fitting mayor. He looks like he's a mayor. And if I show you picture two, he looks like a villain, okay? So it's the same person, slightly different picture, um, completely different impressions, which shows us that we are somehow misled by subtle cues, right? <clears throat> but people often kind of say like, oh, but I knew uh, as the moment I saw Harold Shipman, I knew there was something wrong. And this comes back to something, and this is my last slide for today, where we want to remain in control. It's really good, right? Last week we talked about self-enhancement, we talked about the illusion of control. We want to feel like that if I see another person, I can reliably judge, I know whether they're good people or not. And if I do so, then... Um, Yes, if I do so, then I'm in control. I can predict my... So there's a real motivated cognition and a belief that you can do it. People often want to argue after lectures I give about this. Like, oh, but is it like, uh, I can actually do it. Or I did it. Or I'm really good. All my friends say I'm really good and so forth. And you can basically kind of see um, the... Um, oh, just, okay. I just saw the chat. You can see um, people trying to hang on and cling to this belief that they're in control and they can predict their environment. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, there's one little section that I didn't come to. So I will add this to the uh, uh, recorded videos uh, for uh, tomorrow. And I'll look at the chat now. I will stop the recording here and answer your questions. Thank you so much.